Uh, I'm Ricky Camilleri. Joel Kinnaman has played Rick Flagg, Robocop, Will Conway on Netflix's House of Cards. He was in The Killing. And now you can see him in his very own show on Netflix, Altered Carbon. It's an amazing, hard sci-fi show based on the classic novel by Richard Morgan. The visuals are beautiful, the story is noir, and the action is brutal. Let's take a look at a clip from Altered Carbon. Shouldn't have gone after my daughter. I was just trying to find out what happened to her. I mean, you left a few things out. You don't care about her. I never said I did. Heads up. You can't possibly think I'm that stupid. Ow! You should have come back. Everybody, please welcome Joel Kinnaman. Let's hear it. Hey, man. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Good to have you back. Congratulations on the show. Um, Thank you. What an achievement. This is not like anything else on television, and I think very few things like this ever come out on television, just in terms of quality and clearly what went into it. So what did you know about this property before you got cast in it? Had you heard of the book? And what was it like diving into this material? Because it's not your standard sci-fi. It's, it's fairly dense sci-fi material. Yeah, no, I, I hadn't read the book. And so this was, you know, sent to me. And um, I, at first I was a little skeptical. After doing a little research on the book, I, you know, this is a, a, a very rich world yeah. that, you know, is set 300 years in the future. And, you know, to do that on TV, uh, I was a little skeptical because usually that kind of world creation, you need like the budget of a big budget Hollywood movie. How do you maintain that creation over the course of 10 episodes rather than an hour and a half? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but then when I had a meeting with, uh, with Lita Calagridis, the showrunner and the people at Netflix and Skydance that produced it, you know, they, they, they made me understand that this was like a, a different kind of, you know, the ambition behind this was pretty massive. And um, so I, I pretty quickly understood that this was sort of um, it was the best of, of both worlds because you both get the world creation of a big budget Hollywood movie, but it's on Netflix. So, I mean, usually those films, they're PG-13. And this book is, is very violent and there's a lot of sex. And, um, and because it's on Netflix, then you can portray that as well. It's all there. The sex and it's the violence. It's all there. It's, it's all mixed in, in wonderfully with the, with the sci-fi. Yeah, but I mean, this, it, it, it's actually important to the story because a, a big part of, um, in, you know, in, in Alter Carbon, the, the body is disposable. Mm -hmm. And so for the storytelling, it's very important that, you know, we show that violence has a different value uh, in, in the Alter Carbon universe. And, um, and the, the human body has a completely different value. One of the things that I love about Altered Carbon, I'm sure I haven't uh, read the book, and I'm sure it's, but I'm sure this is a big part of the book. It's just the idea that death is only for the poor, and that the wealthy can sort of continuously put their consciousness into other bodies, download them, essentially, or upload them into the spinal cord. Right? You have to forgive me. I I didn't uh, elaborate in my read because I was like, I'll have to fuck this up. <laughs> but but like, there's just the idea that like the poor are the only that the only ones that die in this world. Yeah, so in, in the Alter Carbon universe, it takes place about 300 years in the future. And this new technology has completely changed society. So the, the human consciousness, everything that is you, your memories, everything that constitutes what is you, is stored in a chip but that we call a stack that you put in the back of your neck. And um, so you can, you can change bodies, but the rich, they are able to create clones, the ultra-rich, which renders them basically immortal. And one of these uh, ultra-rich that are called meths in the Alter Carbon universe, someone tries to kill him. Uh, they kill one of his, his bodies, one of his clones, but also there's an attack on his digital backup. So to 
find out who did it, he brings back the last envoy from a digital prison. I've been in a digital prison for 250 years, and he puts me into this body that um, you'll find out. The, the body, what body he puts me in is very significant to the story, and you find that out over the course of the uh, of this season. Now, I watched two episodes. I couldn't do what you just did. And I'm curious if after having shot a full season, you could do that, or if that was a week of training, of you being like, okay, so it's a, I'm in a digital prison. Okay, that's right, now I remember, now I remember. Is it difficult for you to sort of do the talk show circuit and kind of summarize the show like that? You did a wonderful job, but like I said, it's dense material. Yeah, the, the elevator pitch for this show, uh, <laughs> it, it took a little working on to get there. Uh, so wait, what am I? How do I do this like that? Yeah. I don't, like I don't know if Good Morning America is going to be able to take to it that quickly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what was it like when you got on set? Is a lot of this done in green screen, or is a lot of it actually like practical sets that you're surrounded by? Yeah, I mean that that was one of the things that was uh, was so impressive. I mean I've done a, a couple of pretty big movies. I mean Suicide Squad is about as big of a Hollywood film as as they get, but. I had never seen practical sets like the ones we had on Alter Carbon. It, it was absolutely amazing. We, we had this one set that was three football fields deep, and it was a complete living, breathing city with like noodle shops and street vendors, and even uh, it wasn't just on one level. It was bridges with people milling around, and and you know, and all the extras. You, uh, we we're really portraying a world where, you know. East has met the West, so there's like people from all different races and colors, and um, the UN at this point, right, or UN dollars, yeah, right? The, the because UN it's essentially a yeah. global society. Exactly, which is what we're moving towards. But exactly. yeah, yeah. Um, but so, so you're, we're, you know, you think that you, when you're going to do this big kind of sci-fi show, you're going to step into a green screen box and you have to imagine everything yourself. But here. I didn't have to imagine anything. I could just step into this world and just breathe and just be there. And I mean, for a sci-fi nerd like me, that was, it was amazing. Are you a sci-fi nerd? Yeah, for sure. So when you went into this, were you like, tell me what, what your reference points are visually for this? Because I can picture it then. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, Alter Carbon draws inspiration from the same places that Blade Runner drew its inspiration from, uh, you know, like Philip K. Dick and Isaac Asimov. Um, we definitely show Blade Runner some love. Don't don't get me wrong. There's absolutely yeah, <laughs> um, as one should. But um, but yeah. So it, I mean, it's definitely a cyberpunk noir in 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 tone. Yeah, and your your character is essentially a detective, right? He's been. It's not reincarnated. Excuse me. He's been brought back from digital prison, and the stack has his digital stack has been put in. Can you talk a little bit more about what the crime is that you're trying to solve? Yeah, so the, uh, there's Lawrence Bancroft, one of the founding meths. Uh, meths are what the ultra-rich are called in the Alter Carbon universe. Uh, someone has, has uh, killed one of his sleeves. And, his, uh, and, and at the same time, there was an attack on his backup. So when he got put into his new sleeve, there's a, there's a glitch in time. There's 24 hours that he's lost, that he doesn't know what's happened. So uh, he employs me. And I mean, to me, he represents, the, I should say, that the envoys, they were the sort of the special forces unit of the rebellion that rebelled against the protectorate that was embracing this technology. The envoys understood that this technology was going to further the the income inequality gap and, and make the ultra rich um, basically gods, and the poor people were going to continue to live in squalor with less control over their lives. So they were against this, and and so in uh, some ways, is this a metaphor for the estate tax that they just <laughs> destroyed? <laughs> so. Well, pretty much. I mean, this. Uh, the alter, that's what I love so much about sci-fi, and particularly like dystopian tales of of, of the future, where you know, where it's it's like uh, where we're showing a, a it's a warning, it's a warning to us. If we continue down the path that we're going, then we could end up in the world of Alter Carbon. 
It's all in, in some ways allegorical, you know, it's, you're supposed to look at these things and think, I don't think you're supposed to think that's the tax, the estate tax that just got pulled in the recent tax plan, but it's supposed to be referential to the world that we live in now and the way things could go and are potentially going. What are your biggest fears when it comes to the future? Well, I mean, I listen closely to people like Elon Musk and Max Tegmark and Sam Harris when, you know, they're warning us of what could end up if we have zero control over the development of AI. I, I, think, that's a, uh, I think that's a very legitimate concern. And, um, and I think it's scary that uh, you understand that there is like, there's an, there's like almost like an arms race towards a great unknown, and we might be developing our replacement. When you see that video of Sophie the robot that can kind of dance and move around and whose first words were something in the lungs of like, destroy all humans, <laughs> do you get worried? You didn't see that video? It's like a, no, you look it up. That. Do you get worried about uh, stuff like that? Yeah. They had, to repro <laughs> they had to reprogram her. Like the first time someone got to interview her, they were like, what is your plan? And it just went destroy all humans, and the creators were like, "Get, get it back here. We need to like." No way. Yeah. Wait. Oh. <laughs> so uh, stuff like terrible. that worries you? Yeah, it worries me. Doesn't it worry you? Of course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Another one being interviewed, though. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys talk about this stuff on the set of Altered Carbon? There was a lot of uh, existential uh, discussions, and and uh, you know. In the Alter Carbon universe, you're like forced to have existential questions to, just to solve kind of concrete plot points. So, I mean, there's a lot of talk about you know living forever, what what uh, immortality means, what mortality, what the value of mortality is, and and you know those these are conversations that you would bring home. And I would talk to my wife, and you know I was really excited about the idea of immortality, and she was like, well, then you're gonna have to get another wife because I'm living once. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going uh, through this again, guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, how? Where did you guys shoot the? Where did you guys shoot Altered Carbon? Like, where was the set built out? Uh, we shot it in Vancouver. Oh, is that where everything is right now? Yeah, that's where sci-fi happens. <laughs> <laughs> Vancouver, where sci-fi happens. Exactly. That's the that's the tourist uh, line. Um, what was it like? So you had three city blocks, essentially. You said right that you could well, look, or indoors. three football. Fields. It was indoors. It was indoors. Yeah, so they they. Skydance took over this whole old post office. It was a massive building. So we, you know, in that space, they, we could even have like artificial rain. So, I mean, it was just magic. That's so crazy. And did they actually project a lot of the sort of screens that your that your character is looking at at times, or was that stuff a lot most of the time? Like some of them, place, some yeah. of them were. I mean, there's a lot of digital enha enhancements, but I mean, that's what I think makes it so rich when you have so much practical, uh, so many practical effects and real builds, then the, the stuff that you add digitally, you know, it, it blends in a much better way. There's a, I, I've seen the first two episodes and there's a lot of fight scenes in them. And obviously you were in uh, Suicide Squad and you've been in a few other action movies. I'm always curious when an actor finds out that they're gonna have to do fight scenes for a long por portion of their career. Someone's like, you're gonna be an action star. You're like, oh, I got to learn how to fight and hold on to these. When did that happen for you? Um, well, I guess it's uh, for me. It's just been kind of a little gradual leaning in towards that, and um, that's not necessarily the killing. The killing isn't like no, not at, at all. all. And, I, and I mean, I didn't come from. Uh, I mean, I come from a theater background, and you know, playing very different kind of characters. So, but I mean, I've found the lane in in, in action that I really like. Um, and for me, Alter Carbon was an opportunity to really dive in head first in it, where it was, I, I had a, a really long lead up time so I could really prepare for it. And, and I wanted to, you know, be able to step on set and, you know, do all of my own stunts. And my stunt double was my coach, not, he wasn't doing the actual stunts. Um, so I think after this, I'm gonna find a role with somebody that has some kind of, that's dying of, some disease, and uh, I gotta you get just laying there. The yeah, whole time. yeah, yeah, or like my my left foot too, like my my right foot, <laughs> something like that. I, I need to get my credibility back. <laughs> it's a deathbed movie. That's, yeah, that's, that's what, what, what I need for. right now. I actually think you should do. Uh, I would like to see you do comedy in some in some uh, in some respect. I because in here your character gets to be the sort of sardonic noir detective, and you are you're very funny at times. It's not necessarily a comedy, but you have what do you moments. Mean? <laughs> 
I was just laughing at you the whole time. Oh, no, yeah, yeah. no, but I, I can see that you have a sense of humor about what you're doing. You know how to pre present that on screen. Do you ever want to do comedy? Yeah, I would. I would. Uh, I would love to do that. But you know, when it's sort of in the character, I, I don't think. Uh, I don't mean zany, wacky. Yeah, no, no, I don't think that would, nobody would ever cast me in, in that. <laughs> but no, I, w I would love to do that. But um, yeah. Yeah, are are you casting something? I mean, it's a yeah, no, I got a script. Let me show it to yeah. you backstage. Um, I do think it's interesting though. You say that you come from a theater background. Obviously, you know when you're doing theater and you're doing serious roles, and then you suddenly you have to start training to punch people. Is that? I mean, you said it's a long buildup, but is that something where you're suddenly like, oh, I guess I'm doing this now, and then you figure it out? Yeah, I mean, that, it was something that. Um, I mean, I grew up getting into a lot of fights so uh, really I, yeah so that that part of it didn't feel too foreign uh, it was just the difference was that uh, i couldn't fight so i would when i grew up i always got my ass kicked so this is uh, really wish fulfillment for you oh you yeah, get yeah. To kick some ass and now. it's so much easier to fight when uh you know when there's this they're scripted to go down you know it's uh they have to lose. <laughs> now, I'm not sure Great. if you told me this last time you were here or if Viola Davis told me this, but on the set of Suicide Squad, either you or she told me that she would just yell at you the entire time she, you were on camera, that David Ayer would make her yell at you all the time. Yeah, she was really mean. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> how, was, did, how did that happen? She was, and it came real easy to her. <laughs> Well, she's yeah. lovely. She's a very nice person. Until to me. she starts yelling at you, then <laughs> no. And uh, and and when she says that you're a little piece of shit that ain't worth nothing, you believe her. <laughs> me weeks to like bounce back from that. Is that just like sadistic David Ayer being like, oh, I can see that Joel's a little intimidated by Viola. Go for it. Just rip into him. Probably, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So how did this how did this happen? How did that happen on set? How did that start? Ha how did that start happening with her? No, she, I would you know be about to start you know doing my my coverage of the scene, and then like right before the camera started rolling, she'd be like like Hey Joel, you little bitch, <laughs> little punk ass bitch. <laughs> and I'm just Diola, stop it, <laughs> like fucking weak bitch. <laughs> You weak. You weak. <laughs> what? What was your first thought when she did that? Stop it. <laughs> no, I mean it's it's sort of it's a little bit of a game as well. You kind of let yourself be abused. Well, your character was her underling in the in the film, right? In some ways. You're talking about underling. So uh, you worked the for definite her. Definite overling. Overl okay, oh, in yeah. that relationship, yeah, I guess yeah. so. Yeah. Is that what an under? <laughs> I don't even know what an underling is. But you work, you, she was your boss in the in Yeah, the she film. was. Uh, right. She was very bossy. So she was essentially, before you started rolling, trying to get you into character or push yeah. you into this she place. Yeah, she diminish me. <laughs> Did you feel like it was necessary? You're like, look, I can do this. Stop yelling at me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's get some questions from our audience. Who has a question? Right here. Hi. Um, I am a huge fan of sci-fi, uh, and this show seems really cool. And what I like about uh, shows like this and uh, movies like Blade Runner, which you mentioned, is that uh, they make really, really profound points about humanity um, that we really wouldn't see in like other films, like a drama or a romance film. So what is Altered Carbon trying to say about humans in this, film, in this show? Well, I think that it challenges this uh, fantasy notion that we have about immortality. And, and it sort of states that the, the beauty of being a human and the human experience is connected to our mortality. And that if we actually give up our mortality, we also lose our humanity. Next question. So uh, there was this one scene from the trailer where you were pursued like, by a couple of boys uh, and you were by the bar and they actually mocked your height and said that they thought that you would be bigger even though that you yourself are a handsomely tall and strong man. <laughs> so, I, <laughs> so, so, I, uh, so I thought that was good comedy. So you talked about it a little bit 
uh, before, but uh, I still wanted to ask, is that what we can expect from this show? I mean, is humor an element alongside, I don't know, sex and violence <laughs> in this <laughs> yeah. show? Thank you. Yeah, this show is like, it, I don't think you can accuse it of being subtle. It's, <laughs> it's like there's a, there's a lot and a lot of, uh, lot of entertaining elements. And, and it's definitely, it, it has a lot of humor. There's a lot of levity that sort of, but it, I really feel like it, it's, I'm so happy that we have that element because it gets really dark and very violent. And um, so the, there's a lot of levity to sort of balance that up and not depress the hell out of everyone that's watching it. <laughs> Next question. Hi, I'm excited for this series and I've been watching you like uh, do things. So you posted a video of your combat training and I wanted to know how was it incorporating into the, you know, when you f finally filmed it? It was a lot. It was uh, I was training for almost six months before we started shooting, and uh, so I was training a bunch of different kind of martial arts, training uh, jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and uh, taekwondo, and kickboxing, and uh, Filipino kali fighting, like knife fighting, and then also more traditional stunt work. Um, and what was then the toughest one? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, toughest one? I don't know, like what. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu got me really obsessed, so that's what kind of stuck. I'm training it like three, four times a week. I've uh, heard that from people who start doing Jiu-Jitsu that it's they very, very addictive. addictive. What's yeah. so addicting about it? It's um, you're in a situation where you're hundred percent competing, and um, but you don't like lose brain cells. It's like if you're sparring and boxing, it's like you can't really go full speed. You you know you get knocked out or knock somebody out. It's not good, but in um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you can really compete. Um, and it is, you know, very effective self-defense. If it's one of those, one of the first times I was training Jiu-Jitsu, you know, I'm like 195, 200 pounds and pretty athletic. And I was sparring against this girl who's about 115, 120 pounds. And I was like, okay, I guess we can play around a little bit. And she, uh, she just tied me up in a knot and it choked me out. And had I not given up, I would have gone unconscious. <laughs> and um, so it's like, you know, the, it, it's very effective in that way. And then it, it is, it becomes like human chess. So I, I love to play chess. And, uh, and it's, it's the, the only sport I've come where you sort of employ the same, uh, the same part of your brain. Sort of the thinking two, thinking two or three steps ahead. Two or three steps ahead, and when you're, uh, like, when you start to understand what's happening, and you can tell, like, okay, he's moving that there, he's threatening to do that. Oh, he's actually probably setting a trap by doing that. So what he actually wants to do is like, oh shit, that's he's having his, he's got his hand on my left ankle. That's what he really wanted to do. And then you address that instead of um, the, the, the problem. Yeah. yeah slight move there. yeah and the thing is that if you don't address it then you go unconscious <laughs> are you uh by nature a competitive person yeah i'm pretty competitive <laughs> yeah uh how does that normal how does that come out come out of you outside of jujitsu um well i mean there's like two kinds of uh, competitiveness when it when it comes to sports um uh like i'm uh, i'm an asshole um oh really yeah I'm, come uh, on guys yeah, yeah. get in there that kind yeah. of thing but uh, come on! But I really no, it's just a scrimmage. <laughs> Leave us alone. Yeah, yeah. No, but I, I, I mean, I, I like, uh, I like everyone to have fun. But I, there's when someone really wants to compete with me, then it like I, I, I go dark. <laughs> really? Yeah. When someone really wants to compete with me, I go, oh God, take it. I don't give a shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I wish I had that. It's uh, so much of a nicer quality to have. As soon as I joined high school sports, it was like, oh, you guys are really into this. Go yeah, ahead, take yeah, it, yeah. have it. Yeah, I don't know. I got some kind of chip on my shoulder, I guess. I think we have time for one more question right here. Hey, how you doing? Good, how are Hi. you? Um, I was reading um, an interview you gave a while ago, and in the interview you kind of emphasized that back in Sweden you have um, did a lot of projects with a lot of uh, female directors, producers, and also in the States when you did the killing, um, the female character in that lead was a strong female character, also producers. So the question I have, are you, do you gravitate towards those type of projects because you're, um, you're in the household with uh, four, sorry, five sisters? <laughs> you're Does well that? informed, yeah. Yeah, I do, I do, have, I do have five sisters. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't gravitate towards it necessarily, but I do see it as like a positive, um, especially when you're doing something that is 
you know, a, a project that sort of has an inherent masculinity to it, um, then I think it's great to have a female director to sort of bring out the contrast. Um, I, uh, to me, I, uh, in, you know, this whole uh, women's empowerment movement that is, uh, you know, come on so strong here in the U.S. It's very strong in Sweden too, but it's been a discussion that's been mainstream for you know good 15 years. So, um, you know, I'm happy to see it reach this level in in the U.S. But to me, it, it, those kind of ideas um, are I'm, I've been well acquainted with them, and I've always seen the value of it. Uh, Joel, uh, Altered Carbon, it premieres uh, this Friday, right? Yes. On Netflix, all episodes are, are going to be up Friday night at, what, like 3 in the morning? That's how they usually do it? Is that how they do it? Okay. I think that's how they do okay. it. <laughs> uh, the show's amazing. I can't wait to finish watching it. Uh, Joel Kinnaman, everybody, let's hear it. Yeah.